Mathematical, Argonaut, Rotation, and Input-Output. Aside from an obvious backronym, Mario, or Mario FX, was the codename for a graphical chip produced by London-based developer Argonaut Games. According to Argonaut founder Jez Sand, the chip was initially intended for use on the Nintendo Entertainment System, where it would have enabled an NES release of Argonaut's 3D space combat sim, Star Glider. While evidently impressed with Argonaut's prototype, Nintendo encouraged them to continue developing the Mario chip, not for the NES, but instead for its upcoming successor, the Super Nintendo. The Mario chip, simply put, allowed the Super Nintendo to render filled 3D polygons, Basic polygons, but still incredibly impressive for the time, especially on a home console, which until then had to rely on wireframe vectors to simulate 3D. In 1993, when the Mario chip was integrated into its first commercial release, it shipped with a new name, proudly emblazoned on the box for all to see. The Super FX, the beating heart at the core of Star Fox. Now you may be wondering why I'm telling you all this, and it's because I wanted to make it clear that I think Argonaut had ambitious, innovative minds under its roof. I have them to thank for several games from my childhood. Hell, even games I never got to play as a kid but wanted to. The Emperor's New Groove, Croc Legend of the Gobbos, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and Chamber of Secrets, Bionicle, Catwoman. Oh god, I'm gonna have to play this sometime, aren't I? While not every game Argonaut developed was a gem, I never got the feeling that they ever sold out. Even Catwoman feels like it's trying to do something interesting, and it certainly is interesting, but perhaps not in the way they intended. Hello and welcome back, friends old and new, to Salmon TV. I'm your host, Salmon, and today we are looking at the final nail in the coffin that once was Argonaut Games. Malice. Released for the PS2 and Xbox in 2004. The last title put out by Argonaut before its liquidation that same year. A game that would not die until it dragged its creators down with it. Though the earliest mention of Malice's development implies that the game had always been an Xbox title, the project had actually begun life on the PlayStation 1. I could only find a few minutes of footage from this early build of the game, though if I may be honest, it looks like something I probably would have enjoyed more. The original build of the game shows off a colorful world with large areas for Alice to explore in search of items, some areas I recognize as levels in the final product, and others that look entirely new. Alice could transform into a red cat-like creature, you could use what looks like magic to run across water, and there's footage of a cut segment where Alice is getting dragged behind a dog-shaped polygon by its leash. The enemy variety on display seemed limited to spiders and zombies, but nothing looks out of place, everything clicks. Honestly, the only thing this build seemed to lack was voice acting and a loadout distance that doesn't make me want to cry. It's all got a very inviting sort of cartoon whimsy to it that much better matches Argonaut's original description of Alice in Wonderland with a darker twist. It's obviously not perfect, but this is a prototype. If Argonaut had polished and released Malice for the PS1, it might have been a neat little 3D platformer to stand alongside Croc. In the year 2000, Argonaut officially announced Malice as a launch title for the original Xbox, scheduled for release in late 2001, and the rest, as they say, is history. Cut to May of 2002, and Malice is still not out. Not only is Malice not out, but when Argonaut announced that they had signed a deal with American Ska Band No Doubt to produce the game's soundtrack, it's very possible that what had started as porting the PS1 build to the Xbox had turned into starting over from scratch. Why? Well, because not only had No Doubt signed on to do the music, but lead singer Gwen Stefani would be lending her voice to Malice, and there was no way that she would be voicing the Alice from the original build, who was clearly a child. True enough, when the trailer for Malice finally dropped, gone was the club-wielding munchkin, now replaced by an older, sassier rendition carrying a warhammer made of gears and, evidently, banning her own breasts. Everything had to be ripped up and redone to match this new vision of Malice, which must have been all the more painful for Argonaut when the deal ultimately fell through and Gwen Stefani was Gwen Stagani. Shoot me if I ever say something like that again. It's really unfortunate if you ask me. Listening to No Doubt's discography for the purpose of this video, I think their sound would have done a lot for Malice's atmosphere. It feels like the whole game was reworked with their music in mind, so without their involvement, the game is missing a vital part of itself. In October of 2002, Argonaut announced the project had been delayed with no further comment, and in May 2003, Malice was officially cancelled, dealing a devastating blow to Argonaut that the company never recovered from. By the following year, Argonaut Games closed its doors for good. Though the details are hazy, sometime after its cancellation, Argonaut struck a publishing deal with Mud Duck Productions. And in August 2004, Malice was finally released to the public after roughly five years in development hell. The public didn't care for it. Reviews for Malice were generally negative, citing tedious gameplay, a short completion time, low difficulty, and a feeling that the game, while done, was just the functional skeleton of what was once a much larger, more ambitious title. And what do I think? Malice begins rather abruptly, with our hero being chased by some bird soldiers. These are the crows, a major opposing force throughout this game, and by that I mean 98% of the enemies in this game are crows. 
Hello. And goodbye. Now that is a first line. That's some Dickens level stuff. Malice dives into another room and we find ourselves face to face with the game's major antagonist, Dog God. Yeah, his name's just Dog God. Ah, my dear Malice, we meet again. No! Well, read your fate. Oh, I'm such a bad dog. I don't even know where to begin to unpack all that, so let's let's just move on. Malice is now in the underworld, a matter of some annoyance to the Angel of Death. Evidently, Malice is some sort of goddess, though the extent of her deity status is never properly explained. Later characters will occasionally refer to her as Mother of All, but even Malice seems confused by this. In any case, Death tells us that we're not allowed to die, and sends us back to the Land of the Living to clean up Dog God's mess. We arrive in the Orrery, a spinning clockwork platform at the center of the universe, where we then meet the Metal Guardian. He explains that, while he technically has the ability to teleport Malice anywhere in the universe, the eight logic keys which would allow him to send you directly to Dog God have been stolen by his minions. And since he's basically just a clock, it's up to Malice to retrieve them from the game's various stages. And that's it, we're into the thick of it. The rest of the game plays out in a linear fashion. Though we have eight logic keys to recover, we have to get them in the order determined by the game, which usually entails running through two to three smaller stages before fighting a boss. The first logic key is just given to us as a freebie, and we're introduced to the game's only collectible, Crystal Heart Pots, which give you an extra hit whenever you collect ten. You can't revisit stages, so make sure to grab them when you see them. Our first world proper is the Siren Tree, a forest level that is honestly way, way too big and open for what there actually is to do here, which presently is killing mushrooms. We don't have the hammer yet, we get that later, but our starting weapon kills them good enough for now, and most enemies only take 3-5 to five hits max. You have a basic attack on square, and a slam attack on circle, and most enemies will just mindlessly walk into your hammer swings. Slamming has some wind up, but it does a little bit more damage. I recommend hitting an enemy and then slamming while they're stunned. That's the closest this game comes to combos. Our efforts are rewarded with Malice's first spell, Glide, the only spell that Malice can use in the air, and also, incredibly slow. I'll talk more about magic as we go. It's functional, but you could easily beat the game without it. I remember complaints concerning Croc that the platforming was basic, and the same goes for Malice, though you're honestly a lot stiffer in the air, especially after a double jump, but most of the game's platforms are completely static, and there are not many bottomless pits, so it's rarely a problem. There's falling damage too, but since you can basically jump a second time at any part of your descent, if you get hurt, it's kind of on you. Our first boss is a funky parasite infesting this talking tree. Kinda like Zelda, only if Zelda thought getting bounced around by mushrooms was fun. I don't know if it's even possible to die in this fight, you're just chasing it around in circles slapping it on the ass until it goes down. We get the key, and it's off to the next world. The Siren Tree, a forest level that is... Oh, it's gonna be like that, huh? Here, we're introduced to the Crow Soldiers, absolute pushovers, just stand still and let them walk into your club. The game seems to be convinced that these guys are a threat, like the kind of enemies you spawn in to surprise the player and ratchet up the tension. It's kind of charming. Oh no, Crow Soldiers, whatever will I do? We go into this witch's hut, but before she'll help us out, we need to kill some bugs. I can't think of a single game where this wouldn't feel like busy work. As a reward, the witch gives us our second spell which temporarily buffs our damage. Good for grunts, sure, but it works on bosses too, and trust me, you'll want to use it on bosses. The third key is in the glowworm caves, but Malice is too big to fit in the tunnel, so we get shrunk down to kid size. Hey look, it's PS1 Malice! We get to the caves, but before the glowworms will help us out, we need to kill some bugs. Didn't we just... Alright, bugs killed and we got our third spell, Speed Magic, which does exactly what it says on the tin. Sure would be cool if we could use it to run on water. Actually, it'd be cool if there was water in general. This game doesn't have any. We help this glowworm find her missing babies on platforms that fall out from underneath you. I need 20! Oh, I lose my social security! Oh, hurry! Topical. And it's off to Bonehenge, where we face the game's second boss, the Firefly Queen. Alright, three keys down, three spells, we're making good progress. And if you know what you're doing, you can easily finish this game in one sitting. The fourth key is in Piston Hell, the designated puzzle level of Malice. For the most part, you'll be guiding robots onto platforms using magnets, or hunting around for gears. There's not a whole lot going on here. In one stage, you need to remember a sequence of platforms and jump across them in that order to progress, then repeat that, like, two more times? 
It's not very engaging, but it's over quick. Honestly, that's just a review of this game. In this stage, we're introduced to Crow Gunmen. They die in one hit, but their ranged attack is honestly kind of annoying to deal with because it puts you in a pain state and can screw up your jumps. Shame that the spell we get here renders them completely useless. Bullet Shield negates all projectiles, easily the most useful spell in the game because the only enemies who can hit me have guns. The boss is honestly so forgettable I needed to review my footage to remember what it even was. We finally get the Clockwork Hammer, and it's functionally the same as the club, only instead of taking three hits to kill a crow, it takes two. Great. To get the fifth key, we head to the next world, the Siren Tree, a forest level that is, <laughs> actually it's the sewer level. Pipe and drums, or as I call it, grocery shopping. All we're doing here is hunting down items to open the exit. Five golden cogs, five red cogs, five coins, and a spell that fully restores our health. I used it once, maybe? I don't really find the upgraded spells particularly useful. Next up is a river of toxic waste that we need to ride barrels through. Whoa, slow down, Malice. This is a lot to take in. This is almost feeling like a PS2 era platformer. Thankfully, the excitement ends as quickly as it begins. Next up, the Juju Man. And while he lived in a hut in a much greener looking zone in the PS1 version, he lives in a sewer now. Now that's just insulting. This is a stinkhole. The sewer's out there. I'm gonna have to kill you for that. I'm a very sensitive guy. I'll admit, that line actually came close to making me smile, but that's the thing about Malice's writing. The game is very clearly trying to be funny at times, though whether it's due to references that may very well have been a few years out of date at the time of release, or a difference in my sense of humor, it misses the mark by a wide margin. I only played Malice a few days ago now, and I can barely remember any of the jokes that didn't involve characters commenting on Malice's sex appeal, which... No. Darkened Sky had a cuter redhead who makes dated cultural references, and that game was made to sell me, in summary, despite the game's attempts towards being a comedic grunge-loving experience, the only thing this game accomplishes is looking sticky. I'm getting off track, where were we? Right, the Juju Man. He's not really a boss fight, he runs away as soon as we beat up his henchmen and pick up the keys they drop. His vault contains the Damage Shield spell, a supercharged form of the Bullet Shield that negates all damage. Throughout the stage, the Metal Guardian makes a few comments about how he can't actually sense the logic key you're searching for in the sewer, but he is still detecting a key. It turns out, Dog God has taken advantage of them being a giant, immobile clock and sent a giant robot to try and smash the Guardian up. You warp back to the Orrery and face off against the robot, using pressure plates to activate security measures that deal damage to it. The robot goes down and Dog God made the questionable decision of putting a logic key inside of it before sending it to attack us on our home turf. Thanks for the key, jackass! We're down to the last three keys, and our next destination is the Fire Fortress deep within Crow territory, where we're tasked not only with tracking down the next logic key, but liberating members of the Bird Resistance who are being held prisoner inside. The Fire Fortress takes place entirely within the compound itself, and for being a direct attack on the Crow's base of operations, there's not nearly as much security as I would imagine. We meet the Crow Sergeant, a tougher version of the gunman who still can't get through our shields, and these robot crows who aren't much of a threat but do take a couple hits to kill. Primary goal here is collecting key cards to open doors. It reminds me of Doom or Wolf. 3D, only you have a sledgehammer and it's not as fun. We meet these birds tasked with blowing up some planes and no, they warn us that we can't fall too far or the bombs will explode, but this never happened to me. After the bombs go off, we're ambushed and taken prisoner by the crows, and it's time for a stealth section in a game that really didn't need one. Though I'll admit, there is something amusing about this crow just standing here after he hits me over the head. What's funnier is that these guards can sometimes spot me through walls or from 7 feet away, but they can't see me jump over them, land in front of them, then scurry into cover. Get your hammer back, we get a new spell that slows down time, and we're introduced to these fast enemies that you can use it on. Don't actually use it on them though. Enemies have iframes after you hit them the same way you do, and the spell will wear off before you can hit them a second time. Better to just stand there and wail on them as they are. The boss is a giant mutant crow who summons vines and zombies intermittently. You just smack him whenever he stops to channel energy, he goes down just as easily as the other bosses. I think the Firefly Queen still took me the most amount of time. Final weapon upgrade time! The Quantum Tuning Fork, some Omni-Wrench malarkey that deletes crows in a single hit. They don't even die, they just disappear. I like it. We're headed to the Earth Forest, a forest level that isn't a forest. Like, at all. It's a bunch of floating rock platforms we have to explore in search of parts for a bomb to destroy a shield generator. Sergeants and robots are pretty common, but considering that only one of those can feasibly hit me, it's not much of a difficulty spike. Our final spell is an upgrade for the damage boost, a nuke spell that I don't use very much because the area of effect is a bit too small for something called a nuke. The rest of the level is a minor item hunt with a fair bit of platforming, but other than that, not a whole lot of note. The boss is Juju Man, though he's wearing a helmet now, and sitting in an electric chair. What? He mostly just skitters around the arena launching attacks to keep you away. Just like the mutant crow, you just smack him whenever you get the chance and he'll drop the seventh key eventually. For the eighth key, we're having a bit of a farewell tour, revisiting previous areas of the game to construct the last weapon we'll need to face Dog God, the Mecha Armor. 
I have something of an affinity for giant robots, so any game that caps off with a mech battle earns some fuckness in my book. The armors in Pipe and Dreams, the control chips in Piston Hell, and the power sources in the Fire Fortress. Now, it's time to fight the leader of the crows, this giant robot skeleton bird, and I hate Malice for not making this the dopest boss fight ever. Do you realize how fucking cool fighting a giant robot skeleton bird should be? Believe it or not, the thing actually manages to kill me, and it's here that Malice actually surprises me. Death is its own level. Since Malice is a goddess, she can't actually die, so Death simply sends you to the underworld where you can explore. Speak to the Angel of Death, and he'll set you back at the beginning of the boss fight. Before that, though, we're gonna gather these lanterns so we can enter a second stage where Malice leads a firefly to a lighthouse, netting us a few extra crystal hearts. That's... actually interesting. It means Malice can't be completed 100% without dying at least once. Back to the land of the living, we kill the crow boss, and we finally arrived at the end of the game. All eight logic keys have been retrieved, the metal guardian is back at full power, and now all that remains is to suit up in our mecha armor and challenge Dog God. The final battle lies ahead. The end of a journey across the universe itself. Like you probably guessed, the mecha armor is just a reskin of Malice's model. It controls the same way, your magic works the same way, you use a hard light copy of your tuning fork, and the arena is so big and open that you may as well be normal sized Malice. The illusion of scale isn't even paper thin, it's non-existent. Dog God's boss fight is incredibly dull too. He does a few attacks where he's surrounded by protective flames, then when the flames go out, he shrinks down and scrambles back towards the map center to recharge and you thwack him over the head. Rinse and repeat for 10 minutes. He doesn't start using any new attacks as the battle progresses, there are no changes in the environment to make the battle more challenging. Once you've thwacked him for the first time, just imagine doing that 30 more times and saying, yeah, I've beaten Malice. With Dog God dead, the world reverts back to its original fairy tale splendor, complete with Poppin. Mmm, look at that. And I presume Malice resumes her post as the world's goddess and protector. Don't call me mother, just call me Malice. So was she supposed to be Mother Nature or something? God, I don't know, let's get to the wrap up. Malice is the saddest kind of bad game. A project worked on by talented programmers biting off more than they could chew, shoved out the door before it was done. The music is forgettable and really could have done with the ska sound offered by No Doubt. Platforming is stale, the combat is a joke, bosses are tedious at best, and the story is a fever dream that never stops to explain even basic things. It looks fun and quirky on the surface, but once the game opens up, you realize quickly that it's all very... safe. That's what saddens me the most, and something that early reviews got dead on. What had started as Argonaut's big, ambitious launch title for the Xbox had turned into an aggressively generic platformer so too little too late that it pains me. Malice's attitude may have stood out in 2001, but this is 2004, and Jack 2 had already done the thing where you take a colorful platformer brimming with personality and gave it a grunge aesthetic the year before, and it did it way better. Malice is like Jack 2 without any context. Imagine if Jack 2 had been the first installment, but the entire time you were playing it you saw little things which hinted at the existence of the precursor legacy. This overhanging feeling that something is missing. Like this is not Jack's first time in this world, whatever happened before, it's just gone now. And we're just left to pick up the pieces. Malice is an unsatisfying sequel to itself. And it sucks. After X-Blades, I was worried about how long it might take me to find a topic worth covering next on the channel, but when I saw Malice, I just sort of knew I had to make a video on it. Studio Killers are more than a band I enjoy. They're like a subcategory of video games unto themselves. Born from good intentions or not, they're the closest thing a developer can have to last words. And the thought that you may not even know a game will be your last only makes that more true. Malice herself may be immortal, but her creators were not. Malice exists in this world with blood on her hands. The blood of a company that, even when tasked with making video game tie-ins, never seemed to take the easy way out. Even when nobody expected them to, Argonaut tried. Though Argonaut's doors closed in 2004, their child company Just Add Monsters would live on, and still exists today under their new name, Ninja Theory, producing titles such as DMC Devil May Cry, Enslaved Journey to the West, and the Hellblade series. I'll admit, I haven't played any of these games, but knowing that some of Argonaut's DNA persists in this world makes me feel a bit better. Thanks for sitting through my long-winded ramble about Malice. I'm grateful I could share it with you. As we end today's broadcast, I would like to thank my patrons for their continued support, and if you are not presently subscribed to the channel, I humbly request that you consider it. And regardless of what you do next, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, however long it may be. May the Argo sail on in our memories. Roll outro.